I have a big fat dog at home that was thrown out of a truck. She was skinny as a rail when I got her. All you want to do is fatten them up, make them happy. But a human being that desperately cries out for the companionship and the partnership of another human being is wanted, needy, disobedient, not in God's time or plan. No, they're cursed. They've been cursed. They're suffering from the fall of man. We look at, at people when we go out in public and we see someone at a restaurant that's, um, or someone out in public who is confined in a wheelchair. And we go, oh my gosh, that's so awful. We look at someone who has Down syndrome and we go, wow, what would I do if one of my kids had been like that? Or what am I going to do if one of their kids is like that? Or, you know, we look at other afflictions with a certain degree of compassion. But we look at people with failed marriages or the inability to find someone in their life with a certain degree of skepticism and judgment. And what I felt the Lord saying all day today was you have to say tonight that these people are normal. They have a natural, healthy, God-given, God-created longing desire for companionship. And what they are suffering is a curse. It's a curse. It's a curse that's on all mankind. And when you have people that have had successful marriages, or, I mean, I had a friend who got married and the day after she got married, her husband was run over by a cab. You know, so people who have not suffered illness or tragedy or loss or death or divorce, you have an anomaly. <laughs> you have people that somehow have managed to bypass this curse. But I bet if you ask them, how many people close to them have you suffered over watching them suffer this curse? The answer would be, it's countless. It's everybody else, basically. There's an epidemic. And for some reason, you're immune to that epidemic. But the people around you, most likely are not. It is time, says the Lord, for the church to identify this curse. To identify what's happening in our relationships, in our marriages, in our families, in our homes. For what it is. And stop pointing the finger at anybody and start healing individuals and the most powerful thing we can do for these individuals is tell them again this is another thing that's going to upset someone that they're victims of this curse see we sure don't want to be called victims and we sure don't want to see someone tell someone it's okay to call themselves a victim but we are victims of this curse. We are living byproducts of sin and death. If we are divorced, if we are alone, if we are suffering with longing for companionship that isn't happening. And as a church, we reach out to so many people in so many walks of life who are suffering 
from the curse of the fall of man. And we say to them, this is because of sin and death that this is happening in your life. But we are going to partner with you and we're going to stand with you and we're going to help you overcome this curse so you are no longer a prey and a victim to it. Lonely sucks. It's devastating. Poverty sucks. It's devastating. Hunger sucks. It's devastating. And we who have felt it know that everyone feels it in some area of their life at some point. But those who aren't currently feeling it have a hard time empathizing with people who are suffering. I've had the good fortune of having people in my life over the last year who seem to really get that I really don't like being single. TV land? Okay. <laughs> that would make a great story, wouldn't it? So Albert Brooks calls me, then what do I do? <laughs> It was interesting when you were in a movie, dude, but in real life, leave me alone now. <laughs> God wants the single, lonely people to know that that is an affliction that will not go away until it's satisfied that it's not meant to be repented of and delivered from. If you were hungry and you wanted a sandwich and I said to you, you need to pray that God will deliver you of those feelings, that would be cruel and psychotic. In fact, Jesus used that as an example. He said, you being evil if your child comes to you and asks for bread, are you going to give him a stone? Of course not. How much more will your Father in Heaven give you what you need? Ask anybody what comes to mind when you say religion and sex and they'll say something like well it's wrong it's wrong if we do not start training our people that we were created for partnership love companionship and sex we are creating another generation of religious people who feel guilty and dirty about their pursuit of relationships and what they do once they have them. And when you look at how many Christians' marriages end up in divorce, you have to wonder why. When, why? How many Christians battle with it's wrong for me to love my spouse this much. I, I, have to, I have to tell God I'm sorry that I can't stop thinking about my husband or my wife or, it's, or, or sex is dirty and it's wrong or he wants me to do this and I really want to do it but I heard somewhere that Christians don't do that. Well, that does not a healthy relationship build. And where does that end? Wouldn't it be really great if I just went on a tangent now and talked about Christian sex for the next couple hours? You learned so much from me tonight. <laughs> 
i'll save it for another night